Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us at the uh, NOAA Innovators Series. Today, we're going to be talking POPS, a portable optical particle spectrometer for atmospheric research. And I'm going to turn it over to Derek Parks. Thank you, Katie. Um, again, this is Derek Parks with the NOAA Technology Partnerships Office. Thank you all for joining us today for our NOAA Innovators Brown Bags. Um, for those of you who don't know, if it's your first time, these are sessions where we highlight NOAA's innovations, NOAA's innovators, and uh, particularly uh, technology that we've transferred out of our laboratory and, and into uh, some sort of use in industry or elsewhere. So today we have Dr. Rushan Gao, and he's a research physicist at our uh, Earth System Research Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado. He's worked there since 1992. Um, he leads the Atmospheric Composition and Chemical Processes Group in our Chemical Science Division, Sciences Division, excuse me. And he specializes in instrument development and field measurements related to air quality and climate. Um, and as Katie mentioned today, we're talking about one of his inventions, the portable optical particle, particle spectrometer, which we have uh, successfully commercialized. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Gao and let him entertain you for the next number of minutes. So Rishan, it's all you. Thank you, Derek, and thank you, KD, for the opportunity uh, to give uh, our, uh, to present our uh, instrument here. And uh, so I'm going to talk about the POPs, which is essentially a uh, particle uh, sizing and the counting um, instrument. And uh, for uh, people not that familiar with uh, um, particles in, in the uh, atmosphere, and uh, uh, you probably heard the word uh, aerosol, and which essentially means the particles suspended in the air. And the aerosol is the uh, uh, pollutant on the surface and is regulated by um, EPA. And uh, it also uh, plays uh, uh, several roles in the uh, uh, climate change, in the climate forcing. And uh, so this is uh, uh, something that's very important for NOAA to uh, study. Um, so aerosol um, has a a, an atmospheric lifetime uh, uh, from a few days to a few weeks. And uh, this lifetime is long enough that it can, uh, the aerosol can be transported uh, in the regions even around the globe. And you can see this uh, picture taken by the NASA satellites and you can see the um, um, air pollution uh, aerosol got entrained uh, into the cloud field here. But the problem is the uh, this lifetime is uh, too short to be uh, to, uh, for the aerosol to be uh, distributed uniformly uh, around the globe. And so to study the aerosol, we need a lot of measurements at different places at different times because it, it changes all the time. And uh, so the uh, you know for our for our scientific research we want more and better measurements. Okay, so generally speaking, that when we do scientific measurements of aerosol, we use kind of sophisticated, expensive instruments like the DMT's UHE SAS or the LAS from TSI, and those instruments are great, but they are big and they're heavy and uh, they are fairly expensive. And so certainly there is no hope to deploy those things all over the world uh, all the time and um, get lots of measurements. So uh, you may also uh, heard of those cheap aerosol sensors. Uh, and uh, when I typed it in the PM 2.5, uh, which is the EPA definition of the aerosol protein. Um, when I typed in the sensors, uh, Google shows up a lot of those cheap sensors. Uh, so those are very small and very light and uh, very cheap uh, uh, sensors, but they are definitely not of the same quality. And uh, you know, they, they can make a, a neat device and put it in the 
in your house to uh, or around the roadside for for some monitoring purposes but it's really not good for uh, science research okay so the big question is can we develop an aerosol instrument that is small light relatively inexpensive but yet it's good enough for science quality measurements and the short answer is yes and so uh, a funny story is that we uh, came up with this idea during uh, one of the uh, uh, Global Hawk uh, uh, UAV uh, uh, measurements uh, in October uh, 2011. And the Global Hawk does 24 hour flights. And you sit in front of the computer for a while and then watch the data coming in, and then you get bored. So we started to discuss that what can we do and, uh, you know, for the uh, Atmospheric measurements and what's important to you know, and uh, then we decided well maybe we could come up with some uh, clever um, device. So that's out to, that is possible. And uh, so um, when we come back to uh, uh, came back from uh, California to Boulder and uh, we start to uh, collect the parts and start to pre uh, prepare for test and. Uh, um, so one day it was a snow day, the lab was closed and uh, I decided to walk into the lab and do some tests. And then, well, uh, you can see this uh, laser is lit up uh, and uh, I'm not going to bother with uh, technical details, but uh, this experiment essentially show that uh, uh, it is possible that, uh, um, as I wrote in this email, that we were at the 90% confidence level. Um, so uh, quickly after, soon after that, uh, um, we um, come up with our first uh, uh, prototype. And uh, uh, as you can see, this is all made uh, for aluminum and it took uh, quite a while in the machine shop to get this thing done. But nevertheless, this one shows that, uh, yes, we can do it. Okay, so, but also when we played with this thing and we realized this probably is not the best design. And uh, so we start to explore the other possibilities. And so at this time uh, of, um, that we started here, um, the hype of 3D printing. And so one day that we decided that maybe we could also try use the 3D uh, printing uh, to make this in uh, uh, cheaper. And so we uh, searched the, the web and find that, well, there is actually a uh, very inexpensive $650 printer that we could buy. And so we bought it. Well, it turns out that, that was probably, um, at least for me, that's probably the best $650 invested for this uh, scientific research. Uh, so with this printer that we quickly tried the different configurations and you can see that uh, uh, soon after we got to the printer we come up with the second generation uh, prototype and which is slightly smaller than the previous one and much lighter uh, but still this is not quite good enough so we quickly tried the third generation um, prototype and which showed Great promise. Okay, so up to this point that uh, we were still doing this in as a hobby, and we're basically doing this in, uh, in the after hours, uh, during weekends, in holidays, etc. And uh, this is really not a formal research project. So uh, what the breaking point, the turning point came is the. Um, uh, NOAA OAR special early stage experiments, uh, uh, the SEED grant uh, in 2013. And so we saw this opportunity and we uh, uh, teamed up with the uh, NOAA PMEL and uh, wrote a proposal uh, to put the uh, POPs and other instruments on the uh, PMEL uh, UAV and, uh, and we got funded. And so this is a, a really a, uh, a, a turning point that made this in a, a real scientific, uh, you know, a, a research project. 
Okay, so um, with the seed grants, uh, we quickly come up uh, with uh, a fourth generation um, optical device. Uh, you can see that it's not very much different from the third generation. Uh, slightly smaller, but uh, but the details really inside uh, inside this box. And the, the, for the G3, we spend you know tens of hours to handcraft the one piece, uh, those pieces together. And uh, for the seed results, we actually produce something that has the potential to be mass produced. Um, I want to uh, say uh, also here is that the, with the seed money, uh, our division also come up with uh, another uh, neat instrument. And this is developed by uh, uh, Dan Murphy et al. And this is a very small uh, scanning uh, sound photometer that uh, um, can measure the AOD very sensitively and on the UAV. Okay, so back to PAS, and so this is the uh, uh, product of the seed grant. And uh, this one, you can see it's still in pieces, and uh, that's uh, that's because this is going to put it on the UAV, and so we don't really have, you know, the UAV is cramped, it's, uh, cramped so we can really have to tuck, tuck everything uh, at different uh, small uh, places, and so that. And the uh, um, here is a com uh, the compute data system developed this specifically for the pops, uh, and uh, the computer here costs a thousand dollars. So um, let's see. And uh, this is a uh, you know this thing works, and uh, but still you can see that it's uh, pieces. And uh, Steve Sakara, um, our electric electronics engineer uh, came up with the idea, say, why don't we put this thing together into one piece? And uh, uh, we call this the system integration. And uh, now you can, and they said, well, great. So this is a great idea. Why don't we do that? And so now you can see that uh, after some effort, we put everything together into a neat package. And here, this red card here is a new computer that uh, is developed by our software engineer, uh, Laura Watts. And uh, so from a $1,000 uh, expensive computer to this little computer cost like $60, $70. Um, so because of this uh, effort and other uh, contributions, Steve won the uh, OER in prior of year award uh, in uh, 2016. Um, so here is uh, uh, our uh, current uh, POPs and uh, the specs are here and essentially it is uh, just over a pound of weight and five watts of power and uh, um, it is fairly expensive to uh, produce uh, if you discount the labor cost. And so we call this one a losable. It's not necessary, uh, well, it's not cheap enough to be called disposable, but it's losable. Um, that means that if we lose one, we will not lose <laughs> sleep over it. Um, so I just want to point out that uh, we were pretty lucky that uh, when we started to develop this instrument, that a few technological breakthroughs uh, uh, become uh, uh, available in this time period. And one is this cheap laser, uh, it's derived from the Blu-ray DVDs and the 3D printing that makes the manufacturing uh, job very cheap. Um, and uh, the microprocessor-based microprocessor -based computer system here uh, that really greatly reduces the electronics cost. Okay, so uh, Derek asked me to, you know, uh, give a little bit to, uh, our, uh, you know, my take of you know, the uh, uh, developmental work. And uh, so to me, um, it's just like this is really like still that the, the three key things are the uh, software, hardware, and mechanical engineering uh, job. You know, so we can come up with a fancy idea, but we don't really know how to finish it. So 
this is where those uh, people that can come in and uh, help us to make to realize this dream into a real thing. And here you can see that uh, from a, a sketch to a real product, so we need the mechanical engineer, we need the um, electronic engineer to work, and when we uh, make make a final product, we need a software engineer, we need the electronic engineer to make the uh, data system, to make the interface to work. So those are really the key um, resources or as the help. Um, and we were really lucky in our division uh, that we have uh, uh, those resources. And here we sh uh, show a picture picture of Laura Watts, our software engineer, Steve Sikora, our electronic engineer, and uh, Rich McCoughlin, uh, our mechanical engineer. And uh, they are great. You know, without them, uh, you know, we cannot really uh, pos we cannot possibly finish the uh, pops project and uh, a bunch of other projects. Um, okay, so um, um, also to you know to get the thing working that the, it is a teamwork. And uh, here is a picture of a part of uh, uh, personnel that contributed to this project. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them all. And you can see a long list of people here. Um, anyway, so, so once we uh, developed this instrument, so the first the balloon application we or first the field application we did was a balloon uh, flight in China that we carried this uh, instrument to China and uh, attached to their balloon payloads and uh, we got some great results and as a result we wrote a paper published in the PNAS. Um, and of course, this is a seed uh, funded uh, project. And so the objective is to put it on the UAV. And so here is the PM, PMEL Manta UAV. And uh, the uh, POPs is sitting inside. You cannot see, but you can see the inlet here, uh, also inlet. And uh, on top of it here is the, uh, um, the mini SASP that Murphy developed. So um, after we developed this instrument, we see a great demand from all over the world. And there was so much so that we have to actually pick and choose to you know, uh, find the most interesting and most useful place to go. And uh, the reason that the everybody wants it, of course, is because it's a small yet very sensitive instrument. So we can stuff this one into a bunch of uh, different platforms. You can see that it's starting from a small drone all the way to uh, the uh, Global Hawk UAS, which can fly all the way to 15, uh, 19 kilometers. And then uh, we can put it on the bicycle and we can now put it on the balloons. Uh, uh, and uh, we can ultimately that we put this one on the NASA DC-8 and uh, went around the world three times uh, during the ATOM mission. So um, for those uh, uh, deployments that uh, mostly we take advantage of its uh, small size and lightweight. And uh, then we uh, took on two new projects which we take advantage of its low cost. And because it's low cost, we can deploy a lot of them uh, at once. And this is a, one project is called the Pops Net. We build up a network uh, um, of Pops in uh, one uh, model grid, the, uh, the uh, global model grid. And uh, we use that to help reducing the representation error of the uh, climate models. And uh, this is a collaboration with the DOE and the University of Leeds. Uh, the second, uh, a new application is the SAGES uh, 3 satellite validation. And uh, so in total that we're going to uh, launch just over 30 POPs uh, in Boulder and uh, uh, in Lauder, New Zealand. And this is pictures of our New Zealand uh, uh, colleagues launching a POPs here in purple. 
um, last spring, I believe. So um, this is a, uh, the tech transfer talk. So we'd like to spend a few minutes to talk about the uh, commercialization. So when the POPs um, news spread and we got contacted by different people about the possibility of tech transfer. And uh, well, we are scientists and engineers and we really don't know what to deal with it. And we really don't have the interest to, to do this in uh, uh, ourselves. And, uh, uh, but we thought that this is something that the probably should uh, should be done. And so we contacted the, the uh, Technology Partnership Office uh, in March uh, uh, 2015. And this is when uh, Derek um, stepped in and helped us out. And uh, so when we started, uh, started in March and uh, uh, the, the whole thing went really quickly and in July, the tra tax transfer was done. And as a result, a new, a new company, uh, Hendrix Scientific, was created. And so this entire process was, as I say, very quick, and it's quite painless for us. You know, so basically, Derek took all this tedious detail work, uh, um, and uh, we didn't have to worry about that. And uh, so this is a web page of Hendrix Scientific with their list of their uh, products um, and the pops on top and uh, this uh, open pass uh, cavity rena instruments and the packs. I want to point it out that both those instruments actually are also originated in our uh, division and the licensed to them. And this is a picture of the, their commercialized the POPs instrument and the mix. It. Oh, it's a fairly pretty instrument to compare out to ours. So um, I want to point out to say that even though the um, the tech transfer, uh, the, the paperwork is a very painful to us, but that does not mean that the, there's no additional effort is needed. Uh, in order to transfer this uh, technology to uh, Hendix, now we spent a, a quite a bit of effort uh, trying to teach them how to build this instrument. Um, and so this is, you know, just as a warning that if you're thinking about this thing, you have to really think that, uh, well, there's actual foreign work uh, uh, need to be done. Anyways, so, so, um, so why we do this? Well, there are a few reasons. Um, one reason is we are actually helping the uh, U.S. economy grow, um, and um, you know we with, uh, we helped the uh, forming a new company and uh, and to see this company uh, thriving and grow. And so as you can see here, that uh, Hendrix now has six uh, full-time employees, three interns, and. Uh, so we, uh, uh, even though that we don't have a, an in, a financial interest in, uh, you know, uh, in making pops, uh, that we do have a, a scientific interest uh, to see the pops get used as much as possible. And uh, so we certainly could not do that, but the Hendrix could help us doing this. And you can see that. Uh, they already sold the 50 pops into various countries, areas, and they have 80 some uh, uh, pops uh, either ordered or uh, to be ordered. And um, the another benefit of this collaboration or transfer is that the hand actually can back and help us with the pops uh, improvement. So. Um, I would like to point out is that the, you know, the ultimate design of the success of this uh, tax transfer is that the, we are now actually buying pops from Hendrix. And this uh, is great for, for us because that frees us from, uh, you know, those tedious work, uh, but it's good for them too. Um, 
So, in conclusion, the autopsy's low cost, lightweight particle counter for science, of science quality. And the uh, POPSI has been um, successfully de uh, deployed on various uh, platforms uh, and uh, it is uh, commercially available. And the text transfer was a success, in my opinion. And the process is uh, um, was painless to us. Okay, and uh, so here's my uh, contact info. And if you have any questions afterwards, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Rushan, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, so Katie right now is uh, opening up the floor to questions and we'll see uh, what we get from the audience. But do you, um, <clears throat> uh, can you talk briefly about what your next uh, POPs activity might be? Um, yeah, so um, we uh, <laughs> we are actually, you know, the, the POPs uh, um, has a lot of applications, potential applications, and we are only limited by our um, financial and human resources. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, um, so the immediate uh, applications uh, uh, is one is a pops net which is that we're going to deploy uh, 26 pops uh, in the uh, uh, southern great plain uh, uh, arm sites at the doe um, and the, which is in the uh, uh, oklahoma and uh, so we're going to uh, Put those pops in the weather stations basically and uh, doing continuous two year uh, measurements. And uh, with those results, we hope to, uh, uh, to reduce the uh, uh, model uncertainties uh, um, in, in the climate model. So that's one, uh, so that's one big project, and we expect it to. Uh, uh, makes the first deployments uh, uh, in October and uh, that full deployment by end of this calendar year. Uh, the second uh, the second one uh, is uh, to uh, uh, basically validate the uh, NASA SH3 um, satellites and uh, we have a uh, we're funded by the uh, by NASA to launch uh, uh, 32 uh, pops in uh, in Boulder, Colorado, and in New Zealand um, uh, for the for the sage validation uh, for the sage validation. Validation. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. Katie has some questions now that she will pass on to you. Thanks, Sir Sean. Uh, our first question is whether the um, computer is based on a Raspberry Pi or Arduino or neither. Uh, the computer is what? Is it uh, based on like a Raspberry Pi or oh. Arduino or neither of those? Uh, no, neither of those. Those we 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 looked at those uh, computers and at at least at the, at that time they were not powerful enough. And so Laurel found out that there's a different processor uh, called the BeagleBone Black or BBB, and which is, uh, I would say, much more powerful than uh, Raspberry Pi and than uh, the uh, uh, than the Arduino. And uh, so we use the, the BeagleBone Black uh, as our uh, data system uh, processor controller. Um, it has two uh, PRUs uh, um, that essentially are uh, um, FPGA microprocessors built in there, and uh, so we can actually program to do really fast uh, sampling. And uh, so uh, with this computer, we can actually uh, some, uh, count the particles approximately uh, 28,000 particles per second. That's a lot. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, just kind of following up in that vein, what range does the POPs have? Um, the uh, person asking said that aircraft-mounted uh, 
DMT probes go for uh, 0.68 to 50 micrometers. Right, and so um, ours is not as good as the there's close but not as good and so let me go back to the spec sheet here okay so here um so our detection range is from uh, 140 nanometers up to uh, 2.5 uh, uh, micron or uh, 2500 uh, nanometers so this is our range Okay, so um, I want to point out uh, is that the, when we say this is our range, we don't cheat. Um, well, cheat is probably the wrong word. We, we uh, when we say we have this range, we have 100% 100 detection of the particles within this range. Okay, so the commercial products usually, when they say their low, their low limit is such and such, usually them, they mean, one, that at that point, their detection efficiency is 50%. Okay, and two is that the, usually their detection range is determined by, uh, determined by um, uh, a specific uh, type of aerosol called the PSL. And uh, with the PSL calibration, um, it's not really suitable for the real uh, world aerosols because uh, they have a different type of, a different value uh, for the index of refraction. And so this is a little bit technical, but the, the, the bottom line is using those kind of calibration the lower detection limit is artificially low, okay? And uh, so when they use the real world uh, particles, their detection limit will be actually a little bit higher. Yeah. So, uh, but nevertheless, they are still somewhat better than ours. But, uh, the, but the point is ours is good enough for a lot of scientific applications. Okay, thank you. I'm um, kind of following up on that. There are a few questions about um, the data collected. Is there a website that's showing uh, what measurements have been taken around the world? Are there any trends that have been analyzed so far? Um, yeah, so um, that's a good question. Um, so a lot of this uh, um, data collected, uh, um, those are in at our sites, and uh, they're not open to the uh, to the public. Uh, well, okay, they are open to public if they ask. But the point the point is that we have not really publicly made uh, known to this product. But uh, when uh, those the data taken, uh, let's see. The data taken on the uh, uh, NASA uh, program, you know, the, the Global Hawk, the uh, WB57, the uh, DC8, those data actually uh, are in the public archive uh, um, at the NASA. And uh, so anybody could go there and download the data. Um, and then uh, the our new, for this project, the PopSnet project, we actually plan to uh, broadcast uh, real-time or near real-time data um, in at our uh, websites, and so anybody interested in this could contact us and uh, get a link and uh, go uh, uh, go see go see it in the real time. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a question from Greg Bloomberg at the NASA Goddard program, and he said that they're going to be flying their uh, POPs sometime in the future. And is there a particular um, ME code that is used in calibrations for the PSL spheres? Uh, yes, uh, he's certainly welcome to uh, contact us, and we can uh, uh, work together to 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 make a 
uh, to make that pos uh, you know available for him. Awesome, thank you. And this might be more of a Derek question, but who owns the patent now on the pop? Um, do you want me to address that, Rishon, or do you want to talk about that? Oh, you go ahead. Yeah, so um, we initially did this fairly quickly. So we had filed a provisional patent application for the POPs and then um, did the transfer based on the provisional patent application. We actually, uh, since it was successfully transferred to the public, have not uh, chosen to file a non-provisional patent on this. So it is uh, essentially an open source technology at this point, but the um, Handix uh, has taken the, the reins and is able to uh, actually provide a much better product than uh, than we would be able to at this point. So uh, it is it is essentially open source at this point. Yeah, I, I might uh, add a little bit is that the, I think at least the NOAA part is the open source and uh, the uh, uh, Hanix did help us uh, make some improvements, and so those improvements has their um, in, uh, IP. Um, exactly. so, so those are uh, we're not free to share with anybody else, and they have to contact uh, uh, Hanix to get information from them. Correct. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> I should have should have been more clear about that. Thank you both. Okay, we have um, one last question, I think, and this seems pretty fitting. Is there any secret, um, Dr. Rishan, to uh, being successful with new inventions like this? <laughs> well, my, I would say those two, you know, this one and this one is at uh, least my secret, you know, the, 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 you know, those people are really the, you know, our asset, uh, Noah's asset. That uh, you know, you you can come up with an idea, you know that that idea, if, however great, however clever it is, uh, without those people, it's really difficult to 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 get this in a, into a uh, you know mature stage that. Uh, uh, nowadays, it's just really difficult for one person uh, to come up with something that is uh, great. So, uh, why, I guess one exception would be would be Dan Murphy. I mean, he really can, you know, develop something. Or he he's so skillful that he can just do it himself. But the rest of us will probably have to just, you know, have the a great team to get since done. Well, that is an excellent point. I'm trying to uh, twist Dan Murphy's arm a little bit and get him to come present at a future brown bag, but he's been uh, not quite as receptive as you are. So thank you for, for being willing to do this for us. We certainly appreciate it. Um, did we have any other questions? I didn't see any more questions. So. Okay. Um, Rishan, did you have anything else that you wanted to wrap up with? Or are you good? Uh, I'm I'm good, I guess. Uh, um, yeah, it's a little bit faster than I thought, to, but uh, I guess. Uh, um, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you very, very much. Um, congratulations on all the the fantastic work, and please extend our thanks and congratulations to your team. Um, even though they were not on this presentation, they were certainly part of this presentation. So we appreciate all of their effort. Um, actually, there's another question that came in, are we good? Okay. Um, so, and thank you everybody uh, for listening in on this latest installment of the Innovators Brown Bag. Uh, we'll be coming back, I believe next month we have something. Um, we're gonna be featuring one of our Small Business Innovation Research uh, recipients again next, uh, I shouldn't say next week, next month in September. So please do join us for that. And uh, with that, um, Rushan, thank you. We're, we're going to call it a day. Appreciate well, it. Thank you very much. And thanks for the audience. And thanks for the great questions.
Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.